welcome to take your self off mute to, to ask any of those questions. Also, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a, there's a chat function. So if, as we're going through the session, if you have any questions or any comments to make, please feel free to, to put them in the chat function. Um, and you also have the option of raising your hand. If you click on the participants tab, you should have an option to raise your hand. So we'll be keeping an eye. Um, if anyone raises their hand, and we can, we can pause things and we can answer questions as we go through that, through that um, means also. So I might begin then by just doing a little bit of an arrival exercise. Um, so if I could invite everybody to just get nice and comfortable where you're sitting and maybe just having a nice straight back, feet on the ground, that's possible for you. And, and in your own time, just gently beginning to bring your attention inwards. If it feels right for you, closing your eyes, gently lowering your gaze. And when you're ready, bringing attention to the process of breathing. Noticing the breath as it moves in and out of the body. No need to do anything more than just noticing the breath. Maybe helpful to bring attention to a physical sensation associated with breathing. It might be the change in the air temperature as the air enters through the nostrils or Gentle movement in the shoulders, in the chest, perhaps. You might even be noticing the belly as it moves up and down to the rhythms of the breathing. And in your own time, inviting some gentle movements into the body, maybe the fingers and the toes to begin with, and then even stretching out the body a little bit, that feels right for you. And when you're ready, opening eyes and arriving back into the session. And it's my pleasure to hand over to Roshi to take us through the session tonight. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, can I just check you can see my screen okay? You can see the presentation. Are you able to see that, Kevin? Oh. Yeah, we can see it, see it clearly. Okay, that's great. Um, sorry, everyone, Zoom, uh, my laptop didn't enjoy the Zoom update. Some of you might have had to go through that to get onto the session as well. So last minute panic and getting the presentation up and running but I'm really grateful for that little mindfulness session to help bring me back before starting into the presentation. Um, it definitely works when you're feeling anxious to just take a little minute and breathe so thank you very much for that Kevin. Um, thanks Ronan for welcoming us, welcoming us into this session. Um, 
for those of you that don't know me, I'm Roisin. I'm the secretary of the Irish Support Agency and I also work at UNSW um, as health promotions coordinator there. My background is actually in nutrition, so I studied nutrition as my undergraduate and then I went on to do um, health promotion and public health as my postgraduate. So I have a real interest in um, health research, really interested in um, what the research tells us about how we can help stay healthy and really love kind of looking at that information and translating it into something that makes sense for the general population. So that's a little bit about what I do at my role there. Um, and obviously uh, COVID-19 and our new lifestyles that we've all been asked to um, undertake have really had um, an impact on our health and our well-being and it's really a key time to prioritize our well-being and our health obviously this is a health pandemic so although it's impacting you know everything around us it really is important to prioritize our health at this time so at the moment there's been lots of emerging evidence coming out about some of the unhealthy coping strategies that people are turning to um, during this pandemic, which is natural. It's a new experience for us all and it's really scary and uncertain times for everyone. So we can see that people are using things to try to help you know, cope and process what's, with what's going on. Um, there's been increased um, alcohol consumption rates up to 30%. Um, there's been increased um, reliance on other other drugs, gambling, um, online gaming, lots of ways people are trying to, um, you know, help themselves feel better. But what we know is those things, while they may make us feel better in the short term, they have a detrimental impact to our health and well-being in the long term. So what we're looking to do is uh, focusing on those things that can help us feel better in the short term, but also promote health and well-being in the long term. And that's really what we're focusing on at the moment. So whenever I'm working with the students at the university in their relation to their health and well-being, these are the five uh, main things that I would concentrate on. Um, these relate to physical health and mental health and really there shouldn't be any distinction or separate separation between the two. Our physical health and mental health are really intertwined um, and it's important to look at both aspects and um, our body as a whole. So mindfulness has already been covered by Kevin so we're all up to date in the benefits of mindfulness. It really um, isn't one of these fluffy things that's all you know, the, the craze at the moment. It is really, it's been part of our history for a long time. Our ancestors practiced mindfulness and now in the, the world that never stops, it's even more important than ever to practice mindfulness for our well-being. The three that I'm going to look at this, this evening are sleep, eating well and being active. Um, and stay connected is going to be our next session. So that's really important for our well-being as well. It's actually one of the most important things for our well-being. So we're giving it a whole section on its own um, the next time. So starting off with sleep, um, I put this first for a reason because it is honestly one of the most important things for our well-being. If your sleep's not right, you're not going to be able to practice mindfulness, you won't eat right, you won't be able to be active. So it really starts with our sleep. Um, sleep um, impacts our well-being, no surprises there. If you've had a bad night's sleep, you're going to know about it the next day and so are the people around you because it's really going to impact your mood overall. It also impacts our performance. Um, and this is a really exciting area of research. Um, sorry, I love research, so I'll probably get a little bit geeky in this, but bear with me. Um, sleep and, and performance, there's been lots of studies done recently to show um, the impact that it has. So one study that was carried out where I work at UNSW, they actually had two groups of students and they compared um, one group were sleep deprived and the other group were under the influence of alcohol so they kept one group awake and um, fed the other ones alcohol um, and then give them a range of tasks to do so things like um, reaction times, uh, memory, uh, lots of different measures of performance and what they found that is that even with relatively short periods of sleep deprivation 
Um, so we're talking about 17 hours to 19 hours. That had the same um, impact on our performance as a blood alcohol concentration of 0.05, which is the level that you're no longer allowed to drive at. So really, um, even just like 17 hours would be getting up at 6 a.m. and going to bed at 11. So it's not a massive amount of time. And that has the same impact on our performance. So quite often we'd be driving like that. Or we may be um, thinking, I'd love to go to sleep, but I've got a really important um, piece of work to do. I'm going to set up and work on this for my presentation tomorrow. But always thinking to yourself, would I do this um, you know, when I'm drunk? And you probably wouldn't, so don't do it when you're sleep deprived either. Um, in terms of our overall health, really important at the moment with the, the virus and coming into flu season, um, sleep, it, impacts you know our risk of developing chronic illnesses um, in later life but even in the short term um, there's been studies that have there's one in America where they had um, they measured the sleep patterns of a group of people over a week and after the week they give all the participants a, a droplet of the common cold virus so they give them a nasal droplet of that and they were looking to see who was more susceptible to develop the, um, the common cold as a result of that. And what they found were that people who got less than six hours sleep per night over the previous week were actually four times more likely to develop the cold than those that got more than seven. So now, during the midst of this pandemic, it really is an important time to prioritize your sleep. Um, sleep deprived people also respond more poorly to vaccinations. So for flu jabs and other vaccinations that we would commonly get, if you're sleep deprived, you're going to have a more blunted response to that. So now when we're all holding out for this magical vaccination that is going to change our lives, it's really important to prime your body to have the best response to that. So we all know that sleep is important for us, um, but it can be elusive for many people. And many people do struggle to, um, to fall asleep at night and to stay asleep. Uh, so it's especially important at times, at really stressful times like this, that we practice good sleep hygiene and that can help us get into healthier sleep patterns. So how many of us go to bed at night and look like this girl here with her phone? Um, with the blue light straight into her eyes and then turn off the phone and expect to go to sleep straight away. Um, you might have, have done that and noticed that it's not very helpful. So that was an example of poor sleep hygiene. We really want to have down times from our devices um, because the, the blue light alone, um, it messes up your circadian rhythm and it makes you think that it's daytime when in fact it's nighttime. But also you're going to sleep with all this information just being thrown at you at, at blast and then not having time to process that. So with sleep hygiene, really important to avoid stimulants before bedtime. So um, the, the, one, the main one would be caffeine, but also tobacco can be a stimulant as well. Um, caffeine has a really long um, half-life, so it stays in your body for a long time. So if you're having you know, strong coffee, even in the afternoon, that's going to really impact your ability to fall asleep um, later on in the evening. Moderate alcohol intake, um, some people might say that a glass of wine before bed can help them fall asleep um, and that may be the case um, but it's about the quality of your sleep then later on so after a few hours your body is starting to process that and break that down so your body's not really uh, in that rest and digest state that it needs to be in. It's working really, really hard trying to break down this alcohol. So you will find that the next day you're actually more tired again. Aerobic exercise is really important. So getting your heart rate up during the day, ideally spending time outdoors. So getting the natural light and that helps your body know the distinction between you know being awake and, and sleep time. Creating the right environment. So the, the phone would be an example of something that's not good to have in the bedroom. So if you do have the phone, putting it away um, out of sight whenever you're going to sleep. So things like uh, seat masks, if you have you know, a street light outside that's keeping you away. If your other half is um, snoring, using um, earbuds, anything that's going to help you get the best night's sleep. 
making sure that it's a, a good temperature for you as well so it's not too hot in the summertime and not too cold in the winter time and as establishing a bedtime routine so really trying to allow your body to wind down in the evening so putting away the work putting away your laptop your phones um you know reading in bed just doing things that will help you relax and setting your body gets used to this routine and thinks okay now this is when i'm going to sleep but if you're on your phone and you're on your phone all day your body isn't able to distinguish between time to be awake and time to fall asleep so we're really aiming between six and eight hours each night. Um, what's really important though, is that we um, go to bed and wake up at the same time. So even if eight hours sleep is not gonna be realistic for you, um, you can kind of compromise on that by just having the same wake and uh, go to bed times. Um, and that's really, really important and lots of research to show that you can kind of make up for less sleep by, by having set patterns. So unfortunately, that means that you can't, you know, set up all late all week and then at the weekend catch up for sleep. That doesn't really help us. That just throws our um, sleep pattern out of whack completely. Feel free to jump in at any stage if you have questions about any particular part of the presentation, but I'll, I'll have any questions at the end as well. So eating well, really important um, for our health. I don't think there's any surprises there. Most people um, know that it is. It's also really important for our mental health. And there's been lots of studies showing that um, Diets, particularly the Mediterranean diet, um, can actually help prevent and treat depression in um, Australian adults. So it's one of the really, really important things not to be pushed aside. Um, so you may have heard lots of talk, you know, over recent years about the gut microbiome and um, the role it plays. So the gut microbiome is essentially um, your kind of the the first defense in the body against, um, you know, foreign viruses and, and attacks. So we really want to have a good gut microbiome, which is um, full of good, healthy bacteria. Um, and some of that is just based on our genetics and about life experiences. Um, but diet and exercise are actually two of the key things that we can control um, to help promote a good gut microbiome. So the Mediterranean diet, um, which is shown in the picture here, this time and time again is shown to be one of the healthiest diets that we can adapt um, and this is across all populations and it's essentially based on the foods that people in those mediterranean countries would have um, as their staples and what it really is is a minimally processed diet so it's thinking about what are the whole foods so one of the easiest things to think of when you go for your shopping and you're comparing, for example, two cereals look pretty much the same. One of them has maybe a four-star health rating. Um, you're not really sure what the difference in the two of them is, is. Even if you can't interpret the nutritional information and the nutritional table, just look at the ingredients list. What you're looking for is the one with the less ingredients, the better. So if something has a big list of ingredients, you can't pronounce half the words you've never seen or heard of them before, the chances are that's going to be heavily processed. We want whole foods, natural foods, the less ingredients, the better. And if there's no ingredient label, that's even better again, because then you're getting the real whole foods. So Mediterranean diet is really um, rich in whole grains and legumes. So it's, uh, in general, we don't get uh, enough whole grains in our diet. And this is one of the key things for our gut microbiome. So we normally get about a third of we, what we actually need in a day. So it's really important to choose whole grain where possible. So things like your bread, pasta, rice, um, always choose the whole grain um, versions of those. Obviously fruit and vegetables, you need to get your five vegetables and two fruit per day. Um, and what it does contain is nice healthy fats. So things like olive oil is really a big feature in the Mediterranean diet. Um, lots of fish, um, all those kind of healthy brain foods. Uh, sweets is on the list there as well at the top. So what I would say is that, um, you know, you have to have a little bit of flexibility in your diet. Allow yourself to have those treats that make you feel better. But 
don't feel bad about it enjoy it eat it mindfully allow yourself to have it and then you know continue on with your healthy diet from there the mediterranean diet actually recommends that you enjoy meals with others as well so um, rather than sitting down in front of the tv and eating your dinner and not really thinking about what you're eating using it as an opportunity to connect with your friends, your family, your housemates, and that's really important. And I would say get your nutrients from foods. So lots of people thinking, should I be on you know, supplements at the moment, especially with flu season and the virus coming? If you can get your um, nutrients from foods, that's much better because then you're getting all the extra benefit benefits. So you're getting the fiber that the, the nutrients would be found in, and you're also having that feeling of fullness, so you're not relying on the sugary foods as well. Oshin. Um, yeah. Can I just ask you a question just about, about the food before you go on? Um, what, would be your, what would be your take on, you know, there's, there's been a big push towards vegetarianism and veganism. What would be yeah. your take on that? Um, so I think that's if that's a healthy diet and you're using like whole vegetables, whole fruits and um, not relying on like processed foods to kind of get the fake meat as people would refer to it, then I think that's a healthy, a healthy diet. Um, there's lots of evidence um, to say that, you know, there's an argument for and against. So some people would say that as humans, we're not meant to be eating meat and then others would argue that we are. Um, so I think as long as you're able to have an unprocessed diet, then that's fine. I know vegetarians, one of my best friends growing up from school was a really strict vegetarian and she had actually one of the worst diets that I'd ever seen because she had a very restrictive diet where she didn't eat anything different and she had a vegetarian pizza and chips every day for lunch. Um, so that I wouldn't recommend if you're still having a lot of variety making sure that you're still getting your iron from you know non-meat versions of food and um, so there's lots of iron in like leafy green vegetables um and making sure that you know you speak to your gp regularly and if you're not lacking in any nutrients then it's absolutely fine um but i wouldn't say that um, personally i'm not a vegetarian and i wouldn't say that we all need to be vegetarians um there's it's just trying to have that healthy version of whatever diet you are on. Great, thank you. Okay, so just on um, physical activity, so as I said, this has a big role in our gut microbiome as well. Um, so in terms of having a healthy microbiome, it's actually recommended moderate levels of activity. So very um, intense athletes and people who have, you know, really strict exercise re regimes can um, have issues with their gut microbiome. So moderate levels of activity is perfectly fine. You don't need to be an elite athlete um, to get the benefits of exercise. Um, so obviously being active also helps us stay a healthy weight, which is prevents you know chronic illness and really important for that. But it's also an opportunity for us to get out in nature and be mindful as well. So there's lots of benefits on that. One of the, the best things you can do for your mental health as well. I know personally, since COVID-19 hit, I really have to think about being active a lot more than I naturally would. So normally I'd get up in the morning and I would um, I would hop in my car, but then I'd have to park about 20 minutes away from the university because it's so busy. So I get my steps in there. When I'm in the office, I'd have meetings all over campus, walking up and down steps all day. And um, so you naturally are getting those. If you're like me and you're working from home at the minute and for the foreseeable, you really have to be more strategic and getting those steps in. Um, so we're aiming for 30 minutes each day. So obviously the more rigorous the, acti vigorous the activity is, the less you need. Um, ideally trying to stand. So they, you may have heard the saying that sitting is a new smoking. So in terms of like the risk of cardiovascular disease, it's really um, detrimental to your heart health to sit all day. So things that I would recommend is drinking lots of water. So you'll naturally have to get up and go to the bathroom and refill your cup. Um, so just trying to give yourself those micro breaks. Don't make every break a food break, which is what people tend to do is they get up and go to the fridge, but say, okay, is this break and a physical activity break? Am I going to, you know, get outside, get some fresh air? Really trying to spend time in nature. 
so much evidence to say actually spend time in nature really really good for your physical and mental health um, and if you can use it as a time to reconnect with your friends so maybe um, if you're you want to chat to people with your earphones in or if you can't see them face to face even better really important to be realistic about your um, goals so um, don't set yourself up for failure if you're just starting out with activity I know I'm never going to be a triathlete so that's not my goal but it may be to do a couch to 5k something that you can achieve because once you achieve those goals it helps you build momentum and you know that feeling of oh I was actually able to do that let's help myself a slightly harder goal the next time and that's really how you keep going and if you can give mindfulness activities a go so things like yoga um pilates those things but you're going to get the benefit of mindfulness in there as well um and just before i finish up and take any questions i really want to stress that uh, it's okay if you're not doing all the things you know we should be doing at the moment this is a really challenging time for all of us and i think sometimes we can look on social media and see people who are getting up in the morning and working out and practicing mindfulness and baking banana bread and doing all these amazing things and doing everything right and it makes you feel bad about yourself just go easy on yourself this is a new experience for us all um, and just start with little small steps and build yourself up if you're having an off day Believe me, everybody has those. They maybe just not necessarily showing them on social media. So um, go easy on yourself. Reach out to your friends. And if you need to get professional help, um, that's totally okay to do that. And I really recommend that you do. So that's it from me. Um, I'm going to try to hop over because I've got a funny screen at the moment. So I should see you all again. So if there's any questions, please um, fire away. Um, Roisin? Yes. Uh, hi. Um, you may, um, it was interesting you were talking about the gut. Um, are you able to, um, like, uh, probiotics? Um, what, can you explain that a little bit? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 everyone seems to say make sure you take one, but I actually don't know why you would. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I actually... Um, I don't take probiotics myself, but I'm not um, anti-probiotics at all. Uh, there's lots of evidence to say that they can be really useful. So there's there's two types. You may have heard of probiotics and prebiotics. So probiotics are actually when you consume a live version of um, the bacteria that is good to have in your body. So normally it would be a mixture. There's different types um, of uh, probiotics. So um, there's different versions and the quality will be different between different ones so some some of the more expensive ones might have you know higher quality um probiotics so that actually is ingesting live bacteria which will then grow in your gut and multiply and hopefully thrive and and then you'll have your own kind of supply with, within you need to take them quite regularly but it's it's basically like planting it in there and then it will hopefully grow and um colonize within that um, the prebiotics is actually just eating like healthy foods that promote a healthy gut so that would be um, foods that would then um, support the healthy the good bacteria that you want in your body to thrive so um, things like kombucha or you know or sorry the the probiotics are come from fermented foods so that's one of the things you'll see probiotics and and you can make your own fermented foods as well Prebiotics is things like um, onions, artichokes, uh, those kind of foods that you could naturally get in your diet and that uh, just gives the nice environment for probiotics to thrive. So much um, research going into that. I'm not taking one myself, as I said, but if you are interested, I would encourage you just to do a little bit of homework and read into them, uh, look at the different um, you know, strains that you're going to get um, mm. and see how they Okay, thank you. Thank you. No worries, Maureen. It's just a couple of uh, comments in the chat box 